How difficult is it for you to live in this post-truth era where Brexit, Trump have all come about because of the rise of anti-intellectualism, something that you've been fighting against your whole life? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a serious problem, actually. When people ask me what are the great threats to civilization, I mean, it's true that, that things like very unlikely things like asteroid impacts, that there are those threats out there in the universe. But really, I think the biggest threat to our civilization at the moment is the disconnect in democratic societies between um, facts or data, our attempts to predict what will happen in the future, and the, the understanding of, uh, of our electorates. Um, and so Carl Sagan, actually a great hero of mine, foresaw this. He wrote a great book called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, back in, I think it was the early 90s. Um, and in it, he said, he said he could he could imagine a time in his what well, worst nightmares in his grandchildren's generation, where in our societies that are entirely based on science and engineering, uh, there's a there's a disconnect between the majority of voters and their understanding of that society, and the way the society actually works. But he said in his grandchildren's generation, it's happened in his children's generation. He would have been shocked to see that. Um, but if you take one of the great issues of the day, um, sort of climate change, for example, um, what you see there is a, a mistrust of modelling. Um, so you know, I think it's an absolutely legitimate question for, for any society to ask, what will our climate be like in 2050 or 2100? Then you ask the question, how then do we go about answering that question? Well, the only way you can do it is by taking measurements, of average temperatures and sea temperatures, etc., and then building models uh, to see how that climate may change in the future. You can check it actually by running it into the past as well, so you can check your models against observation. That's that all models are wrong. It's a very famous saying, but it's the best you can do. And, and what what troubles me is that there's a reaction against this way of thinking, which is the best we can do, which is essentially in the, in the enlightenment, in science, uh, and if you get a reaction against that, then it becomes very difficult for um, sensible policy to be made. A large part of that program, you sort of joined politics and climate change very interestingly there, and a large part of that in both cases has been misinformation, propaganda pretending it's fact. Yeah. How do you counter that? Well, I think it, the answer, it's, it's an easy answer to give, but difficult to implement. It's education. It, it has to be that, that we equip uh, citizens in our societies to, to, to be able to differentiate between false, just propaganda, essentially, and um, facts. And fa fact is a, it's a difficult thing for scientists because there are no absolute truths in science. It's one of the foundations um, so the, I'm a, a fellow of the Royal Society. The Royal Society's motto is on nobody's word. I'll take nobody's word for it. So the, I think the, the currency, I think, in today's societies, the, the valuable currency is trust. And it's who do you trust? Which voices do you trust? Uh, you need to be given the skills to, to say, well, this, all right, there's this person on Twitter with three million followers saying one thing. And then there's the, the, the Royal Society or the, 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 the government science department saying something else. Uh, who, do, who do I trust given that I can't do the simulation myself? Another example following on from <coughs> politics and climate change, of course, is the, the vaccination issue and anti-vaxxers, as they call themselves, and the, the propaganda and films they've been putting out, which here in New Zealand has led to a drop in vaccination rates. Yeah. This must be a similar <coughs> but equal concern to you. That's extremely dangerous though, it's baffling to me. I mean, one of the great human achievements was the eradication of smallpox through a, through a worldwide coordinated vaccination program. It's probably one of the greatest achievements of modern civilization. It killed hundreds of thousands, millions of people in Europe and beyond, and it went, gone. I suppose the argument is some kind of freedom to choose argument and and it is true I mean the, the psychology is relatively easy to understand it because I'm a parent you know and the idea that you will actively do something to your child which is slightly unpleasant for them which is take them to the doctor and have a vaccination um, is, is it's one of those things that I can see you could do I'd rather not do that um, but the point is that it's clear that, that these diseases childhood diseases that we've largely controlled or eradicated 
uh, are going to begin to rise back again. Uh, if, as a society, we don't properly vaccinate our children, it's, it's a huge risk. One of um, humankind's other huge issues today is depletion of our own natural resources. Now, just a couple of days in Australia, a couple of days ago in Australia, you raised the, um, the idea of using energy and resource intensive industries um, in space. Yeah. Um, how would that work? Well, it's, it sounds like science fiction, and, and the reason it's been in my mind is I made a documentary for the BBC recently on commercial space flight. Now, commercial space flight is already a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. And the, the thing that's happening is we've now got cheap access to orbit for the first time because we've got reusable rockets. Both Blue Origin, uh, Jeff Bezos' company, and SpaceX have got reusable rockets now. So why? Why are they doing it? And, and the, the answer is, and Jeff Bezos puts it very eloquently, that this is the best planet we know of. <laughs> and that's uncontestable. It is our home planet. We have evolved on it. This is the place we need to live. But there's a challenge because we also want a growing and increasingly more interesting and richer civilization. Most of the world's population are living in what, relative poverty, certainly to us if you think about Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, they've, there's vast numbers of people who need access to more energy, more resources. So how do you grow the civilization without damaging the planets? And these people have noticed that if you look slightly up into the sky, not, not beyond, out to the stars, but in the local neighborhood in the solar system, there, there are effectively infinite resources available. Uh, not only solar power, but in the asteroid belt, there's everything you might need. So you're talking to, to the, the metals in the asteroid belt are enough oh, to... Fail. Famous, yeah, the famous quote is, is there's enough to build a skyscraper 8,000 stories tall and cover the earth in it, which no one wants to do. <laughs> We're just saying there's a lot there. And now we have the means to get there, that really we have the technology to go. So the, it's, it's almost a, a golden scenario that becomes available where you can expand and grow your civilization, increase uh, living standards for everybody without using the resources of the planet. Okay, I can get my head around the, the multiverse and the expanding universe and black <laughs> holes and the Big Bang, but what was there before the Big Bang? Well, we have a, uh, the textbook theory at the moment, which we teach in cosmology classes at university, is called inflation. Um, and it's quite well supported now. So the, I'll d describe what the idea is first, which is pretty simple, that, that space and time, the fabric of the universe, was present before the Big Bang. Uh, when you, you define the Big Bang as the time when the universe was very hot and very dense. Um, and we measure the time back to that, which is 13.8 billion years, and we have a beautiful measurement. Before that, the theory has it that space and time is still there. They're essentially cold and basically empty apart from the presence of a thing which has got a fancy name, it's called the Inflaton field, but what it is is a kind of stuff that drives a very rapid expansion. So we have, we have a space time that's there and, and the space is stretching and it's doubling in size according to these models every, in scientific language, 10 to the minus 37 seconds. Which slows down and essentially stops and all the energy driving that expansion gets dumped into space heats it up, makes particles, and that's what we call the Big Bang. It's a remarkable thing. You take a sub-nuclear sub piece of space, and this is the piece of space that's going to expand through inflation, through the Big Bang, and onwards, 13.8 billion years, to the entire observable universe today, which has got two trillion galaxies in it, <laughs> according to current measurements. And you can predict little quantum mechanical fluctuations in the subatomic little piece of space, and follow them all the way through, to a prediction for how the galaxy is distributed and you get the right answer. Well, politics, climate change, vaccinations, the mining of space and the big, the big bang. <laughs> yeah. uh, Professor Brian Cox, thank you. Thank you.